Good morning, everyone. Welcome um, to the 62nd Asian Impact Webinar on Investing in Women's Financial Futures. Uh, today's webinar will discuss the challenges faced by women in the Pacific in achieving retirement security and the role that retirement funds can play in addressing these challenges. So while we'll be focusing on the Pacific, these are very much global challenges for all women across the world. So across the world, vulnerability to poverty for women increases and accumulates over the life cycle. In OECD countries, for example, it is estimated that pension payments are 25% lower for women than it is for men and going up to over 40% in countries such as Germany. There are several reasons for this. Um, women live longer than men and are also less likely to enjoy economic um, uh, security, income security uh, in old age. Um, there are career breaks to raise children, part-time work, and other life cycle events that affect women more than men, um, and that results in older women less likely to maintain an adequate standard of living in retirement. Gendered labor markets and life course patterns are the root of women's disadvantage as they age, but the impact can be mitigated by the way in which pension systems are designed. The global gender pension gap is currently estimated 30 to 40%. And this type of data I'm sharing today is, these are estimates because there's a lot of uh, gender data gaps in this space also. Um, so retirement benefits are essential for women's economic security as they age. Yet despite the increased number of women who are entering the workforce, the long-term impacts of lower wages more vulnerable employment conditions and caring responsibilities are resulting in women retiring with lower balances. The implications are twofold. Women are more likely to experience financial insecurity in older age and retirement funds have lower contribution receipts to invest impacting their overall financial performance. So in today's um, webinar, we have the pleasure to hear from experts from the Pacific who will be talking about um, their own experiences across the Pacific and the implications, of course, for the rest of the Asia Pacific region. Um, we have a very distinguished panel. So let me quickly introduce them. So Damien uh, Bedwes, the CEO, CEO of the Islands National Superannuation Fund Pacific Islands Investment Forum, or PIF, Secretariat. Um, we have Melanie Lavaki, man uh, the Manager of Client Relations and New Business at NAS Fund PNG, and member of the PIF Women in Super Working Group. We have Jeremy Cleaver, who is the lead for the financial growth team at the Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative, PSDI, based out of ADB's Sydney office. And last but not least is Sarah Boxall, who is an economic um, empowerment of women specialist, also with PSDI in Sydney. And I'll be first inviting um, Sarah to present a short summary of a recent uh, research that has just been published um, by, PS, by PSDA, PSDI looking exactly at this top, topic of women in retirement. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Keiko, and greetings to everybody from a rather chilly Sydney. I'm just going to pull up a screen here. And I'll be sharing with you today a brief presentation that just looks at some of the findings from the report Keiko mentioned, which is about exploring the barriers that women face to equal access to retirement benefits in the Pacific. And it also looks at not just the barriers, but also some proposed reforms to address these barriers. So just quickly, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Pacific, ADB operates in 14 Pacific Island countries that are shown here on the map. Now, within these 14 countries, the way that retirement funds are structured is quite different. And this has implications for the role that they play in supporting financial security for Pacific people. And my colleague Jeremy can speak more to that later. So when looking at the factors that impact on women's financial security as they age, the obvious starting point is workforce participation rates. As we know, the amount of money available at retirement depends on the number of years spent in the workforce and the level of income earned during this time. So we know that there are significant gender gaps in labour force participation in 
many countries. So in places like Nauru, we see it's 25 percentage points, up to 33 percent in places like Fiji and Tuvalu. And we know even when women are employed, available data points to quite a significant gender pay gap. In Papua New Guinea, for example, women in formal employment earn less than half of what men do. In Tonga, women's monthly earnings are almost 30% less than men. And in Solomon Islands, women in the private sector earn 62% less than men. We also know that women are far less likely to be in senior roles, and that reduces the amount of their earnings and the amount of money they can therefore contribute. And as Keiko mentioned in the introduction, many of these trends in labour force participation in the Pacific are similar to those in other regions. And this means that there's a global gender gap in financial security. So moving on, we're looking here at a chart that illustrates the impact that women's labour force participation rates have on retirement fund contributions. Now I'm using data here from the Solomon Islands National Provident Fund. So what we know from this experience of the Solomon Island Provident Fund is when we look at the membership at age 21 to 25, so first entering the workforce, women comprise about 45% of the membership. And then once we get to the age group 36 to 40, that membership has really changed and it's fallen to just under 30% for women. Now, the gap in membership combined with lower contributions results in a really significant gap in the fund value for men and women. When you're looking at the retirement age of 55 in Solomon Islands, the total value of women's contributions are 50, just over 57 million Solomon dollars, and men in the same age group, it's almost $170 million. Now, these trends clearly have an impact on individual women, but they also mean that retirement funds aren't getting the full contributions that they could be getting, which has an impact on their investment funds. So the lower rates of membership and contributions mean that women have lower balances at retirement. And this is compounded by the fact that in most places in the world and including in the Pacific, women live longer than men. What I have here is a chart that shows the retirement age, compulsory retirement age, that's in blue, male life expectancy in orange and female life expectancy in grey for the 14 Pacific countries that ADB operates in. And you can see that in some countries such as Cook Islands and Palau and Samoa, women can expect to live much longer than men and well past retirement age. So the combination of lower balances and longer life expectancy really puts women at risk of financial insecurity in older age. And as Keiko also noted in the introduction, reliable statistics and sex disaggregator statistics aren't in plentiful supply in the Pacific. So we don't really have any data on financial security. So what I'm sharing here is some uh, other data that I think can provide some insights into the financial security for Pacific Islanders as they age. So this chart here is shows informal employment rates for both men and women across five Pacific countries. Now, what you can see here, if you can see this clearly, is from the third column, which is 55 to 64, and the fourth column, 65 years plus, we can see that there's actually a significant increase in the informal employment rate for both men and women. Now, what this data suggests is that people don't have sufficient funds for their retirement. And with limited government pension schemes in the Pacific, people are actually being forced back into informal employment to earn an income to survive. Now, this is bad for both men and women, but as you'll see, this trend is more pronounced for women. So. In the Pacific, a lack of adequate savings for retirement is actually common for both men and women. But we, through this study, we identified that there are actually additional barriers that women face in terms of participating in and benefiting equally from retirement funds. So the report actually categorised these in three ways. There's regulatory impediments, organisational policy and practice, and women's economic participation. Now, I've already touched on the barriers relating to women's economic participation. We know that social and cultural norms continue to dictate women's life choices, including those relating to economic participation. The burden of caring responsibilities combined with lower levels of financial literacy and quite high rates of gender-based violence 
are all barriers to women's opportunity to earn an income and therefore contribute to retirement schemes. The report also includes analysis of the legal and regulatory framework for retirement in each of the country, but it does identify a few common regulatory impediments. Many of the funds only cover formal employment, and there are some restrictions on voluntary contributions for those that are either self-employed or operating in the informal economy. And we know this reduces the ability of women to join retirement schemes as they're overrepresented in the informal economy. In some countries, we also see that small businesses are exempt from making contributions on behalf of their employees. And we know again that many of these employees are women. And finally, the funds themselves have some policies and practices that are barriers to women's retirement benefits, including in many cases, a lack of sex disaggregated data, limited outreach to women as potential members and an overall lack of commitment to gender equality within the organisation. So the report then goes on to propose 14 priorities for reform in three categories. So those relating to policy and regulatory reform, organisational reform and outreach awareness and training. So some of the proposed reforms include legislative changes to remove some of these provisions that indirectly discriminate against women, such as things like thresholds for minimum thresholds for voluntary contributions. Also need to see some clarification around the legislation relating to the access to partner benefits in the case of death, divorce, same sex or de facto relationships. In many cases, the legislation here is not clear, and we also know that sometimes customary law can actually supersede what's in formal legislation. Other suggested reforms are things like consideration of options to increase women's balances, such as joint retirement accounts for couples, or facilitating payments by other family, family members, including those living overseas, as there's a pretty significant diaspora of Pacific Islanders around the world. We also encourage the collection and analysis of sex disaggregated data to inform organisational policy and practice in the interest of women as staff and as members. And finally, targeted outreach to women, including those operating in rural areas who have much less access to information and knowledge of retirement um, and saving for retirement. So my final um, slide is that these report findings and reform recommendations were presented to the Pacific Islands Investment Forum CEO Forum in 2022. Now, the Pacific Island Investment Forum is an industry group of 20 superannuation, provident trust and sovereign funds. And my fellow panelist, Damien, is the secretariat for this group. So at this 2022 forum, the group endorsed the establishment of a regional women in super working group to work with the membership of PIF to take forward three out of those 14 priority reforms. And they were the collection and analysis of sex disaggregated data, facilitating voluntary contributions from those in the informal economy, and working on financial literacy training for members with a particular focus on women. Now, the working group of which my panelist, fellow panellist Melanie is a member have been working hard to take forward these reforms, working with the membership. And this included things, the first step, which was a survey of all the current data collection and analysis processes that were then presented in the most recent 2023 forum. And this work is ongoing. So for those that are interested, the full report can be found on PSDI's website. Um, and I'll say thank you and hand back to Keiko. Thanks so much, Sarah, for sharing some of the high level um, recommendations and results of your report. I've had the pleasure to read it myself, and I really appreciate the concrete kind of uh, policy steps, which I hope um, will be able to be taken forward. And I think it's really wonderful to hear that one of the working groups of the Pacific Islands Investment Forum is a women and super. So my first question actually for, for the panel that now we're going to move to that kind of moderated panel part of today's webinar is for Damien. So um, why do you think that, um, why did why did PIF identify women in super as, as a priority? And how do you see this kind of having crossover, spillover benefits um, for regional retirement funds? Thanks, Keiko. That's a, a really good question. 
we were actually, um, this came up as part of um, a look across the funds at our ESG program environment, social and governance. And a big part of what we do is ensuring um, there's a lot of equality in, in everything that we bring forward. So when we started looking at the equality, um, we had noticed across, uh, globally across uh, a, a number of areas, particularly in developing countries, um, the gaps in the identification that um, there were issues around women and retirement outcomes. So we actually first um, attended a, a presentation through the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees. And it was through that organization that we found that they had a particular program um, that was addressing the needs in Australia. Um, and, and for that demographic, we didn't necessarily align with that demographic. So when we came together as um, the CEO forum, what we wanted to do was to understand what the issues were across our membership. And of course, in the Pacific, we're very diverse and, and we're very, very well spread out. So what we, um, what we have and what we've identified is that um, the issues are very different uh, from the East to the West and the North. So um, bringing together a woman in super group um, was the best way for us to bring to the table and understand what the issue was. For us, we needed to understand, is there an issue? What is the issue? What is the gap? So that was our driver to uh, establish Women in Super. Thanks so much, Damien. Um, so based on what Sarah was presenting, there were 14 kind of recommendations um, coming out of that report, uh, looking at so policy reforms, regulatory reforms, tax incentives, better enforcement of employment and labor laws. What do you think are the kind of the interventions that are the most promising and, and why? <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, so 14 recommendations was a big step for us. Um, so what we wanted uh, to do was to, to pick three that we believed were achievable um, and also gave us a true picture of what we were experiencing. Um, so we needed to acknowledge that there is an issue. What we found in our CEO forum was that um, a couple of our funds, and we're going to possibly hear from one soon, um, have actually uh, um, started to address, uh, they've identified and they're starting to address those issues, and they've got some really good programs um, that are actually in place. So um, some of our funds, are, and, and that's ourselves included in the Cook Islands, we um, even struggle with the ability to um, collect data to understand if there is an issue. So we had um, had a wide range and we found that um, of, of the 14 recommendations, the, the first one that made sense for us was to obtain the data um, so that we can get a true picture. Um, obviously, once you have that data, then you can work on the gaps. And we believe that um, uh, from the feedback from all of the CEOs and the funds is that the informal economy was the biggest area where we could make an impact in terms of um, obtaining contributions and supporting them to, uh, to begin saving and build towards their retirement. And doubling with uh, presenting to the informal economy is education. So if we can educate, attach the informal economy and we have the data, we believe that those were the first three strongest steps to, um, to begin to address the issue. Thanks so much, Damien. I want to move now to um, another member of the PIF Women in Supergroup. So, Melanie, uh, you're a manager at Nest Fund, um, PNG's largest retirement fund. Um, and recently, Nest Fund established a subsidiary of the main retirement fund called EDA Super, which is a voluntary contribution platform that targets farmers, sole traders, and small business owners. Um, what prompted Nest Fund to establish uh, uh, Eda Super, and how has it performed so far in terms of uh, number of members and value of the contributions? Thanks, Kato. Um, the Eda Super product was actually developed in 2006 by NAS Fund. Um, over time, we've had about 55,000 members across Papua New Guinea, and we've seen the reach mostly in Port Moresby being the main center. However, they have, there has been um, much 
um, on take in out, outside centers from Port Moresby. So the majority of um, Papua New Guinea's and, and the reason that the product was created firstly was to address and capture individuals that were not inside the formal sector. Current laws in Papua New Guinea insist that if you are um, a, a formal employee of a registered company that has 15 or more individuals, then you must contribute to a superannuation fund. However, it forgets the individuals who are not captured inside this, um, this description. And that makes up most of our economy, um, small farmers, um, small to medium enterprises, SME owners, et cetera. So the product was created to capture them to ensure that they also can be prepared for retirement. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, and now that NAS Fund has this dedicated fund that can facilitate voluntary contributions, what do you see as the challenges facing women in PNG in preparing for a secure retirement? Yeah, so from um, what Sarah and Damon mentioned previously, in terms of NAS Fund, we do a lot of engagements outside um, in the informal and also formal um, spaces. But when I say informal, we go out to villages, we visit small towns, um, talking to them about NAS Fund products and how they can save for retirement. But at a super specifically, we have seen the uptake um, is more long lasting when it's facilitated through a third party, because the current model would be an individual is required to make an individual contribution or can make an individual contribution to their superannuation account. However, due to the limited amount of um, banking resources available within country, that activity of going or having to travel to the nearest bank to make a deposit, come back to a NASFAN office, um, remit the receipt, so to speak, and then have those contributions updated is one of the issues that we've identified that members, male and female, and most specifically females, um, having to move away from their daily activities to go and do that is one of the issues, um, one of the reasons that the uptake has been quite slow. Um, but we, we do now employ um, avenues where they can do remote contributions. So we have like um, a mobile wallet, uh, we've partnered with a local firm that can allow for contributions to be remitted by your mobile phone. Um, we've also gone on board with um, uh, another local bank called My Bank that can do contributions, and they're focused in the informal sector. So really tapping into established um, platforms out there to make sure that continuous contribution comes in is 50% the work, the other 50% is the constant communication and education that we insist to um, share with our members or prospective members. Thanks so much for sharing that, Melanie. I know ADB has been working also a lot with uh, my bank on digital IDs and rolling those out. And there've been some wonderful stories about how even though something that uh, is in essence, gender neutral can have a lot of additional benefits, especially for women, and to overcome some of those challenges around women's um, safety and mobility to be able to access key kind of financial institutions. Um, I just wanted to kind of now move to, to Jeremy Cleaver from uh, our Sydney office in, in at ADB. So uh, Jeremy is, is the team lead um, looking at a whole range of issues as well as gender equality. Um, I'd love to hear from you about what you see as the key risks, um, if any, to financial sustainability of retirement funds in pursuing women. Um, including those in the informal economy, which we've heard from our first two panelists as being kind of one of the key gender challenges in the Pacific, mm -hmm. but I have to highlight across Asia and the Pacific, I think uh, women uh, represent 60 to 80% of the informal economy. Um, and uh, yeah, what is the kind of um, target market given high administrative costs and relatively low balances? Over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Keiko. Maybe let me make a couple of uh, comments to begin with um, to illustrate the kind of lay of the land in the Pacific uh, for those of those who may be less familiar. Uh, the first thing is to say um, that many or most Pacific countries um, uh, are generally quite far flung. 
Um, they're made up of a number of different islands, um, or in Papua New Guinea's case, uh, both islands and also remote populations. And so getting to people is, is, uh, is often challenging. Um, the second thing to say is that social safety nets or government social safety nets are um, uh, usually fairly non-existent. Um, and that will kind of frame uh, my approach to the answer. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I struggle with the with the word risk. Um, I think there might be challenges associated with managing a large number of uh, of smaller accounts. Uh, having said that, I think existing systems should be able to manage those. Um, uh, and the other thing to note is that um, uh, contribution levels in the Pacific tend to be uh, generally high. So in many countries, um, <clears throat> uh, employee contributions are in the neighborhood of five percent. Uh, with then between five and seven percent employee contributions uh, on top of that. So you've got 12 percent uh, of people's salaries going into their superannuation funds. So balances tend to be high and and um, uh, and the 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 funds across the Pacific um, tend to have a reasonable amount of of liquidity. Um, so I think there are challenges associated with uh, with the cost of managing um, the cost and time of managing those um, uh, those smaller accounts. Um, but I'd like to contrast contrast that against the opportunities that that then presents. Um, and so, for example, um, Melanie was talking about the case of Etta Super, and, and I, I might throw back to her in a minute to just talk about the costs that they see. But in the Solomon Islands, for example, back in 2018, 2019, they set up um, a product called YouSave, uh, which allows, which it's targeted at the informal economy, um, and it allows uh, those in the informal economy to, to open two accounts. One is a, a retirement account and another is, is a quasi savings account, um, which they can, uh, they can withdraw from a few times a year for particular expenses like uh, school fees or medical expenses, etc. And in the intervening four years, um, they now have 37,000 members uh, in USAVE um, with total savings of 68 million Solomon dollars, which is uh, 12 million US dollars, um, may seem like a small amount, but for small Pacific Island countries, um, that's actually a very significant amount. Uh, I would say that 53% of those members, uh, more than 53% of those members are women uh, in the informal product, uh, and about 52% of the savings uh, are from women savers in, in, in that those products. So um, if we come back to the question of social safety nets that I touched on a bit earlier, uh, because governments aren't able to provide those, um, it often falls to the superannuation funds or the provident funds to, uh, to uh, distribute money um, uh, when um, countries see natural disasters or COVID, for example, et cetera. And there is a real balance between trying to make sure um, <clears throat> uh, that the population is is well looked after, and also making sure that they have uh, a reasonable um, uh, pool for retirement, and so that's a that's a challenge which we look at um, constantly with uh, with funds across the Pacific. How do you manage both of those challenges? How do you make sure that people have enough to retire on, but also that they uh, they have enough to look after themselves? Um, and so, actually, the outcomes uh, from uh, from these products in the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea and elsewhere. Are really excellent, um, and from my perspective, really outweigh uh, any challenges or risks associated with um, managing the uh, the accounts. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, those were really great points, and also remind me of some of the experiences we had during COVID um, as part of uh, ADB's kind of COVID response in the Pacific. There was kind of a look at. Uh, retirement funds in some of the countries, I believe. And one of the challenges was getting sex disaggregated data, which was a point that uh, Jeremy kind of um, mentioned. And um, I wanted to just before going to Sarah, I wanted to go back to Melanie about the question about administration costs that Jeremy just brought up. And um, did you have any thoughts um, about that from your experience with Ida Super? Yes, thank you. Um, we, we have seen quite a significant cost um, compared to maintaining the Edda Super initiatives that go up, because like we mentioned, or like I mentioned earlier, um, the likelihood of one individual contributing or continuing to contribute over time is, is not promised. 
um, mainly because it's a voluntary um, option to, to do that. So we try as much as possible to limit the hurdles that an individual has to get over in order to come in and do a contribution for us. Hence the initiatives like the um, mobile wallet um, and my bank um, engagements that we've gone out to do. And also a working model that we have is to go through a third party. So if an, if an entity is coming in, for example, currently we have um, our oil palm growers in um, the outskirts or uh, you know, outside Port Moresby, pardon me, they contribute through a buyer, an established entity that does the remittance on their behalf and sends those contributions, not just to us, but also to our savings and loan society. And they can, the members can use the savings and loan society for short-term needs while NAS fund is for their superannuation or for when they retire. So there are these two factors that we look at or two models that are currently being played and it does play into a high cost in terms of the one-off individual who just walks into um, a center or who we meet um, at an informal setting to register. They're excited at that point, but two months down the line, life happens and they'll forget about going and making a deduction. Whereas if it's within an established platform, all they need to do is provide their consent to the buyer or to the person that's giving the contribution saying that oh, I would then from this amount of stock that I bring to you to sell, a percentage of that will please remit to NASFAN on my behalf. And that's more suitable we've seen over time. Thanks, thanks, Melanie. Um, I'd like to kind of circle back to, to Sarah now. So you've kind of heard the analysts. Um, any kind of thoughts about the role that governments, employers and individuals can play in supporting financial security for women in retirement? Sure. Um, I'd actually first like to commend the leadership of the Pacific Islands Investment Forum on this issue and members like NAS Fund because we've touched on how small the Pacific is, but I think some of these funds only have a handful of staff. So this regional bringing together and addressing the issue and sharing of experience is actually really significant in terms of being able to address these challenges. So I just wanted to first give a shout out there because I think it's a great example of regional cooperation. Now, to respond to your question. So I guess when you look at the immediate issue of access to retirement funds, it's clear that governments set the sort of legislatively regulatory framework. So obviously they play a role in any kind of amendment to the legislation that would address those barriers that we discussed earlier. But more broadly, governments also have a responsibility to address the broader issues of women's workforce participation and lower earnings. So this can be done through things like options for affordable childcare, policies to address gender pay gaps and paid parental leave. Now, equally, we know that employers don't need to wait for changes in government policy to implement policies and programs that might make a more inclusive workplace. And this is things such as equal pay for equal work, um, flexible work arrangements. And I'd also like to give a shout out to a recent example from NAS Fund, where they announced that they'll continue to pay superannuation payments to employees that are on unpaid maternity leave. So that's a great example of the private sector and employers just doing what they know is right and it's going to benefit their, their staff. So both government and employers can play a role in improving financial literacy for both men and women. And this is things like access to information on the importance of savings for retirement, and having access to a range of saving products, such as what Jeremy mentioned earlier that has happened in Solomon Islands. Now, I guess a final point is we know that the burden of unpaid work for women in both the home and the community is a major reason why they're not as well represented in the workforce. So to address this, it needs both individuals and communities to rethink some of these traditional roles that place all the burden for this on women having some more equitable sharing of the unpaid work, which will free women to participate more actively in the workforce um, or as business owners and operators. And then this improves financial independence and potential security. So I think there are a range of actors that play a role directly as it relates to financial security and retirement funds, but more broadly in sort of improving women's economic empowerment and financial independence. 
Thanks, Sarah, um, for also bringing in that broader economic empowerment of women context. And um, especially, uh, I'm very interested in, in childcare also. And one of the um, more sobering facts about Asia and the Pacific is that uh, women work the longest hours in the world when you combine their paid and unpaid work. So, but when you then look at uh, their kind of key kind of financial data about poverty levels uh, and some of the discussions that we've had today about their work in the informal economy, a lot of it kind of draws down to the fact that these unpaid care work responsibilities are real is a real um almost physical barrier for them to enjoy economic policies. And there are good policies to be able to overcome that. And it was really nice to hear about continued superannuation payments during um, maternity leave, which in many countries, both OECD and other um, developing economies, doesn't actually exist. And so those kind of gender pension gaps are really exacerbated by women's caring roles within within the household. Um, so we've already started getting some really interesting questions from, um, from our um, online participants. There was one question that I wanted to address. I think someone was asking about life expectancy. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, when you look at the report, and I think it's also in Sarah's presentation, that you see that there is uh, women are living longer than men. This is not something um, biological, a lot of these are different social factors. And if you were to look at this data over time, um, maybe 50 years ago in um, many countries, um, men were living longer than, than women. So there's a, a, a range of factors. So it's not that women are physically stronger than, than men, though there is a slighter chance, I think from memory, something like 1.1, um, the, the birth ratio um, favors girls. But uh, that can change then after birth. Um, so, just to answer to answer that question, uh, in some countries the life expectancy is not um, as uh, favorable to to women as men. And I think South Asia still uh, there is some um, gender gaps there. Um, so I'm just looking at the different questions here. Um, and one of the questions was um, from about sexist aggregated data, which has come up quite a quite a bit also. So um, this question is from Aiki Kikawa. So if there's a lack of sex segregated data, what are the possible actions to address this? Um, and is the effort to collect data sufficient or do we need to collect new data? Um, I feel like this question can apply to all of the panelists. So uh, whoever puts up their hand first. Go ahead, Jeremy. Did I put up my hand? I apologize. Um, I, yes, I, I, I think actually, I apologize. Um, uh, I think Sarah may be better better placed to comment on this one than me. I apologize. Or, oh, or sorry. Damien. Sorry, Damien. Go ahead. Damien. Sure. Um, thanks, Kega. The um, I, I guess the data really comes back to the, the core systems that we operate in superannuation provident funds. Um, we run registries. So the original core set up of, of how we um, we focus our data generally on the accuracy of the collection of money coming in and applying it to a registry. So um, we were uh, never in the, the true essence focused on um, extracting data for um, large demographic purposes, more about, um, for, for many of us, it's more about enforcement. So um, that, that was why one of the reasons is that um, to, uh, we actually set it down as an objective to improve our um, ability of our softwares across uh, our funds to be able to actually identify and extract that data. So um, for us here, for instance, in the Cook Islands, uh, it's involving actually a whole new system that we're actually um, implementing and bringing in. Um, and that will also enhance the data that we can do so we can drill down into it. So um, technology is a key. Um, historical platforms have given us limitations. So I think what we'll see is across the Pacific and our funds, as we progress, um, the data will improve. We'll be able to drill down and be a lot more accurate in, in terms of that. So um, yeah, that's that's the reason why. And that's uh, a big reason why it's one of our key three um, objectives. Thanks, Damien. 
Um, now we have a question from Eric. So uh, many Pacific Island countries, though not all, have significant remittance inflows. Are there any successful examples of enabling overseas remitters to pay directly into a superannuation um, fund account of the recipient? I can see people thinking, oh, Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, okay, go. This one I, I think I can answer. Um, I think the answer is, is not specifically. Um, there are certainly uh, many funds that allow voluntary contributions uh, beyond the 12% um, uh, mandatory contributions um, in general. Uh, some allow voluntary additional contributions into the funds themselves. Some have uh, a savings product that sits alongside uh, the, the retirement product, um, uh, which the member can contribute to. I'm not aware, unfortunately, of any uh, of any situations where um, uh, a foreign family member, for example, or a foreign-based family member uh, can contribute directly. Um, but Damien and, and Melody may, may prove me wrong. Thanks, Jeremy. D Damien, Melanie, any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Damien. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I I think it's been um, it's it's been dependent on on different different countries, different cultures, obviously across the Pacific. Um, what some experiences inflows, other actually others actually experiences outflows to support um, family members that have actually travelled to more. Um, developed countries um, due to due to higher costs of living. So uh, we've we've seen both ways. Um, money inflows are, are strong in certain countries, and and definitely outflows. Um, Cook Islands for us, uh, our our funds actually flow out. So um, we have a different issue here. But um, actually, just on that, there was um, something that I saw in, in terms of um, if you don't mind me. Just jumping across to one of the questions, Gago. Um, I saw one question that came through regarding um, adequate funds for retirement and and how it was measured. And I put down there what um, we did in the Cook Islands, and I think it's really important because uh, across the region, when it comes to addressing retirement, there's a few issues that we all take on board. And the and the and the first is, are we making a difference? Um, how do we make a difference and how do we measure it? So understanding each country's cost of living is very important. And then you get, then we are able to project and provide policy advice to our governments around contribution rates. Um, how do we get to certain levels to meet those um, cost of living? The, the second, um, I guess the, the flip side of that is also around um, exiting options and, and policy around that. What we do is we sweat across the Pacific. We, we have a lot of funds that save all the way through to retirement and then they cash out. So mm -hmm. there is no security in retirement. The cash, once it leaves the fund, is um, injected into that family, into that community. And more often than not, what we're, in our experiences, um, the funds are spent within the first year. So it's, it's moving forward to a policy that provides a balance of perhaps some cash and a pension to provide that income security. So um, our roles are going to be more about supporting security rather than actually providing that security because there's so many different policies in place and so many different ways to cut it that the best thing we can do is to find our niche and support them with an income in retirement um, to support that, uh, to, to help them meet their cost of living. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of policy driving. And this is where this data is very crucial. Um, we can understand the gaps between incomes, wages, and cost of living. And that's where we, we're going to find some policy changes to be able to drive these um, the, the things like contribution rates, exits. Um, and I saw the other question, matrimonial property. It's got to be split 50-50. Got, got, got to get that all balanced out. So um, we have that in place here as well. Thanks, Damien. Um, I'm actually really struck by how progressive some of these policies are. And one of the questions uh, has is, is around um, basically what's the context in, in other countries. Uh, they've, there's what's happening in, in South Asia or other countries across our region. And I was wondering if any of you would like to kind of perhaps touch on that. Um, any experience that you've had of um, interactions with other regions and 
uh, perhaps to try to explain uh, how you've gone to being so progressive like this in the Pacific. Maybe Sarah? Uh, well, I can't really speak on behalf of Pacific Islanders. I would just uh, note that. But I, I do think, you know, it is surprising to look at this and to see, you know, we often don't share enough from the Pacific of what they're doing because I think sometimes having a small population can actually be an advantage because you have the opportunity to actually put in place policies and processes that reach the whole population. So I think, you know, certainly I live in Australia and so I often compare the experience of what we have. There's plenty of debate and discussion in Australia about superannuation and again, research that shows a huge financial gap between women's superannuation and men's superannuation in Australia that addresses the same issues. And I think to your um, point earlier, you know, the, the case of NAS fund paying superannuation for employees while they're on maternity leave, I mean, we don't have that in Australia. So I think, you know, sometimes the issues and challenges facing people you're not so far removed in these small countries and these small funds. And as Damien said, trying to make a difference. So I think, you know, we see this at the forum we had, had recently in PNG to the point about people getting lumps on payments and sort of spending it. You know, I think that's a real challenge. And one of the other members shared a great example of the financial literacy training they do with members that tackles this precise issue don't get your money and blow it all within two years, you know, even if you think you're investing in a, you know, a good business that will earn you income over time. You know, how do you make sure that when you take this money that you use it effectively? So I think it's the connection, I think, and Damien and Melanie might, you know, beg to differ, but I think it's the con direct connection with your members. And I think Damien actually was telling me when we saw recently that people will come up to you when you're out in public and actually ask you questions and things. So it's quite hard to get away from, you know, your, your clients and your beneficiaries. So I think that really helps to make the processes and policies more progressive than what we might see in countries where there's a greater distance between those. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Melanie, did you have any thoughts about that? And I also had, in addition to to that, it was also kind of a question that um, um, that Damien answered before around kind of household assets, family, and, reg um, and regulations around that, and how to protect women. Um, either, and it's in the report too about women post divorce, as well as as widows. Maybe you could share some of your experiences from NAS Fund on that. Thank you uh, for. Post-divorce, we don't necessarily have any anything, uh, any product specifically for that. Um, the legislation only allows for individual account owners to have access, or if someone has passed on, then their nominated beneficiaries are the only ones entitled to access that superannuation saving. Um, so it's it's really concentrating on one individual. Uh, the account holder in that space, getting all their information, ready their contributions up to a stage where they can access access that information, uh, access those funds at retirement or at the periods that, that Sarah um, mentioned where they, they are disrupted in terms of uh, contribution or normal flow of employment. To add on to what Sarah was talking about in terms of um, from our perspective in Papua New Guinea, the other key thing that, like how we have with Damien saying, people will come up and ask you about it, about their super at any place or time, regardless of if you are in um, the benefit payment section or you're um, an admin driver. It's mainly I've seen because in terms of the assets that we have for individual Papua New Guineans, super is the most, or super is the main asset that you would have. There's really nothing else. We don't have um, government assistance or, or a structured government assistance in terms of um, funding when you leave employment, if you have an emergency. Insurance is not as big as, as, as it is in uh, Western countries. So super is your um, golden egg um, when you need it. So we allow access um, for when members need their superannuation on medical grounds, if a member passes on, then their beneficiaries can access it. And of course, at retirement. So those are also the factors that make it more um, at the top of the head of 
the member or a, a normal citizen when it comes to asking about what are you doing with my money, where are you using it, and when can I access it? Um, whilst you're still here, Melanie, there's uh, another question for you about Ida Super. Um, are the products open to expats or Pacific Islanders in the country, um, in, in PNG as well? Yes, the product Ida Super specifically is um, open to non-citizens also. So expatriates are welcome to contribute um, towards Ida Super. Similar deductions done, we um, need the, your receipts in order to make um, the allocations. But the benefits that a compulsory contributor would have access to are also enjoyed by an Ida Super member or voluntary contribution member. Thanks, Melanie. Um, a question for Jeremy and Sarah. So the data that uh, PSDI, PSDI has been presenting, does this also include data from non-government entities? Uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, I understand the question. So the data that we presented in the report is drawn from a range of sources, including national census data when we're looking at things like life expectancy, income things. So I guess I would say it relates specifically to information we have data from the retirement funds themselves and probably government sources. So, um, I mean, there are definitely other data sources that we could and should be looking at, and this will be part of the work of the Women in Super Working Group as we move forward to kind of unpack some of these issues and, and address them. And engagement with non-government entities, I think, is also something that we see as being important because those civil society groups, I think, are a really important way of reaching some of these people. And I'm actually going to throw to Melanie on this because I think NAS Fund has a great example of working with um, non-government entities, if you don't mind, Mel. Non-government entities. Yes. Sorry. Uh, could you could you say that again? So your the work that NAS Fund is doing with the MOUs you're setting up with women's groups and things to get out there to the rural women. Yes, yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we have a number of memorandums of understanding. Um, one of the main ones was with the Center for Excellence in Financial Inclusion. It's a subdivision of a regulator, the central bank. And they came in, trained about 19 of our staff to enable us to go out and give financial literacy training to our members, current and prospective across Papua New Guinea. Um, the other MOUs that we've embarked on are with um, the coffee industries. So as mentioned, non-government organizations that also have access or have a group of members who are generating income. But most of these members walk around or potential members walk around with cash, there's nowhere to bank. And when there is a shortage or when season's off, they don't have anything else to keep them going for a certain period. That's where NAS funds at a super product comes in. And we capture those within the MOUs to make sure that while you have sufficient income, um, you should be thinking about retirement. And this is the financial literacy that we're providing to show you the basics, budgets and savings. How can you hold a budget? What are the purpose of savings? And of course, the products that NASVAN has to support that um, throughout. So there's a lot of engagement um, that we do with NGOs and also government um, institutions to ensure that the net is, is captured across or spread across the country. But thanks for raising that, Sarah. Thanks, Melanie. That's it. That seems like a really important component of any of the work is making sure that the um, the awareness is there about the importance of saving for a financially secure future. Um, we're almost at the end of our, our webinar, and I think we could have had a lot more questions. And I think a lot of the questions that we have also are, it's been so great to hear about the Pacific, but it would be great to also learn more um, across the Asia and Pacific region. So it's almost like we need to have another webinar on this really important question about um, uh, retirement funds, pensions, and how they impact the later stages of the life cycle for women as well as for men. And 
I wanted to, now that we've spent an hour talking about this, I wanted to kind of go back to all the panelists and just some kind of final thoughts, maybe next steps, what you see as kind of priority areas um, for the Pacific and, and beyond. Um, I'll start with Damien. Thanks, Keiko. The, um, I guess for us, the next steps is um, to drive home the completion of the three objectives. Um, our Women and Super Working Group and the feedback we've had and the support, um, in particular from funds like NAS Fund, Solomon Islands, Fiji, who have come out with some really amazing programs um, and shared that with the other 17 and 18 members across the region, are helping us move forward very quickly. Um, once we nail down the data and we identify those gaps and start closing them, um, the real challenge for us is going to be implementing um, policy. And the policy really needs to be around um, converting cash payments to pension payments to ensure that we at least um, secure that long term regular income to our women and super. Thanks, Damien. Um, Melanie? Thank you. Uh, I think for NAS Fund from, from our end is an encouragement to uh, development partners or project partners that are coming on board to in Papua New Guinea already here establish. Um, one of the main requirements we believe is ensuring that your employees, citizens that are going to be doing your work should have a superannuation account. They should, that should be part of your check checks when you're trying to issue um, a grant or engaging work from local contractors, they should come with a pre-existing condition that they have superannuation account to ensure that that's covered, mainly because current legislation is not spread across or um, forces everyone to be on superannuation. If that's understood by um, the parties involved or partners that are coming in, that will help the spread of um, superannuation savings um, for Papua New Guineans. Thanks, Melanie. Jeremy, any any thoughts about next steps? Thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, so so one of the first questions that came in uh, says, even after trying hard in every funded project, why are we not achieving the set out goals? And I, I think the answer is actually um, uh, funds like NAS Fund and the Solomon Islands National Provident Fund are achieving some really excellent goals. And, and one of the things that, that the women in super uh, group is is doing is learning from those and driving them into into some of the other funds. Um, bearing in mind, you know, countries like Tuvalu ha have eleven thousand people. These are very small countries with very small funds uh, and limited capacity. And so, learning from the likes of NAS Fund and Solomon Islands and others, and 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 driving some of those really great programs into uh, in, into some of the other countries is um, uh, is on the agenda for us at PSDI. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Sarah? I think as a gender advisor, I'm always going to advocate for the importance of sex desegregated data. And I think in the work here, I think that, as Damien said, that's been identified as an early and important priority um, because you've got to understand, you know, are there differences between men and women? And then that data allows you to identify where there are gaps and you can ask further questions, do further research so that you're actually developing policy and products that understand the situation and are evidence-based in terms of understanding and identifying the opportunities and challenges. So I'll always advocate for that. And I'm excited to be working with the Women in Super Working Group to actually progress that across all of the membership, because I think that's going to make a significant difference in terms of their capacity to uh, address some of these issues. Thanks so much, Sarah. So um, we're, we've come at the end of this really fascinating webinar. There's uh, another Asian Impact webinar happening on the 8th of June um, between 2 and 3 p.m. where we'll be looking at um, Asia in the global transition to net zero. So I hope you can join that really fascinating discussion that will happen then. I'd like to thank all the panelists for their insights, for sharing their visions for next steps. And I think there's lots of lessons learned for um, other um, Asia and Pacific regions or other Asia regions from the really great strides that have happened in the Pacific. Um, and so thank you to all the participants also for uh, providing some really stimulating questions. Thank you and have a great day. Bye.